All right, here we go. Um, I am super pumped about this interview. Um, I met Neil Ford at Renee Rodriguez mastermind event. Uh, well, I met you at AmpCon and then I got yeah. to know you a little better at the actual mastermind, which by the way, folks, what Renee is doing, uh, I mean, obviously what he's been doing with Amplify for a long time, I think is super important, super powerful. Uh, but his new mastermind program is amazing. Uh, Neil, I have it to imagine, did you, did you enjoy that? Oh, I know man. you were there as a speaker and a leader, but uh, I've been to, I've been to a few of, uh, Renee's masterminds now. Um, he's been very generous with me, you know, to let me sort of jump into those. And he's got another one coming up in January in Miami. Um, nice. and, uh, nevertheless, uh, I really had a great time with that one. I, and I think you did too. And he always brings in the most interesting people. Um, yeah. I have forgotten the name of the, the, uh, Welsh bodybuilder. What was his name? Oh uh, my gosh. It'll come to me in a minute. I mean, I, literally he's won more world championships. Flex. Than Flex. 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 Lex, yeah. uh, he's got like but, 2 million followers on Instagram. Yeah. And I mean, you know, six or seven time consecutive time, Mr. Olympia. And you would think, you know, just because of the titles that he would be, you know, you characterize him in your head as being a certain kind of person only to discover like Arnold Schwarzenegger, there is so much more to the man and he's charming and funny and uh, just a, oh my God, uh, Rene has a knack, doesn't he? For drawing to him um, an orbit of people that are just so good natured and open and, and professional and uh, well, I never, yeah, I never yeah. would have sought it out on my own, but man, I'm glad I'm connected. Yeah. And then the other thing that I think that makes his community so different, and I, it's a good tee up for the conversation we're going to have, is uh, not only are they super authentic, I mean, every human being is authentic. We're all one of a kind, but well, not they everyone. have figured, well, <laughs> okay, but but they, they, you are unique. It's just a question of are you living your life that yeah. way? Yeah, and, and have you found a vocation, a way to one make money, and two, you know, live from the heart? Have you yeah. figured that out? And I, I know when I went to my first Amplify, I went there to just be a better speaker on stage, and I always called it edu selling. I want to educate yeah. and sell mortgage coach at yeah. scale, and and I came away with oh no, I've I've better connected my heart with my message and. And I think that's unique. Everyone that goes to that event is is seeking that, and and they're also you know very successful people, um, you know both professionally and personally. And it just it creates a really unique um, place. Great energy, lots of fun, wonderful people. I'm not sure you could like that's better than a trip to Disneyland, as far as I'm concerned. And I mean that in all seriousness. It's it's far better than a trip to Disneyland because you get you are rewarded for your enthusiasm and participation and you meet the coolest people i met uh, you know dave in addition to you uh i met three or four people that were just i can tell we would have been fast friends if we'd been in school together and um so yeah the, those renee renee's especially i think his his amplify and his masterminds and that AmpCon was such a neat discovery i was dave i had no idea this stuff went on out there in the world yeah, no, yeah. That, well, no, when people find the mortgage business, I mean, it's a fun space. Uh, so, so let's do this because I, you know, this is our first interview in mm -hmm. this, you know, channel, and with our audience, you know, our audience is either you know top performing loan officers, people that want to be top performing loan officers, or people that manage and lead top performing loan officers, and 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 one of the most important things you could do as a top performing loan officer is be a leader and an influencer and a valuable partner to realtors. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, think of the conversation we're going to have where we're, you know, we're speaking in the mortgage and real estate space. So Neil, FYI on that, I, I'm always about, you know, like my career breakthrough is when I created a slogan that my advice makes a difference. And then I, you know, I've spent my whole adult life becoming someone whose advice makes a difference and creating technology that mm -hmm. helps other professionals have advice that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So I want to I want to make sure so table set for you coming into this you know this this community I want you to just tell a little bit about yourself so that people um, know who you are what kind of you know 
skills and perspectives you'd bring. And then, and then let's get into the conversation of storytelling from the heart. Yeah, excellent. Uh, I came from a background of 30 years in advertising and, uh, or you might say propaganda, which is the, the Spanish <laughs> word for it. It's a, it, that's more proper. The, um, my background, I was in the creative side of the business. So I was um, started out as a copywriter and was writing ads for a variety of different clients for very various different agencies. And uh, I tended to work in the very large agency space with uh, that was very much in the sort of um, model of Mad Men. And uh, over the course of my career, I, I was not a gifted um, writer. I was not one of these people who became famous for their tremendously creative ads. What I did find my niche at, though, was I was I was quite good at selling the concepts to the creative directors and the clients um, because uh, I'm a sort of wannabe actor. And I loved to turn the descriptions of the commercials into little plays. And it's it's marvelous to be able to drag your other fellow creatives sort of into that fun, hey, we've got costumes in the barn and my dad knows music. Let's put on a show. So when we would go over to clients in order to explain advertising, you know, it would be fun. It would be a, it would be an event. And it would be we our goal was to make it the best part of our client's day which I think is incredibly useful for your own purposes and the people that listen to you and follow you. It's if you can make sure that when you show up, it's the best part of the day for the other person. You know, if you have that as a goal, you will be a happy person because you right. walk out with them satisfied. You've had it. You've gotten a big kick out of, you know, trying to make dress the room better, make sure that there were little chocolate covered espresso beans or a little toy at their place setting, or you made the room smell good. Or if you didn't have any control over the environment, you brought some things along that would be fun, you know, place settings and so forth, and little, you know, flower arrangements. But uh, in the, in the world of advertising, as you can imagine, our whole, the whole industry is all about the way you present something changes its value. And so we said, you know, we need to do the same thing when it comes to selling our own work. We need to make the presentation so engaging and so much fun that it is a gift to the person who is on the other end of it. And what I discovered over this long career, and by the way, what that led to was they didn't just want me to present my own ideas. They wanted to teach, wanted me to teach the agency how to present its ideas. So I became the worldwide creative director or worldwide director of creative learning so that I would do the management training program and, and arm people with how to be more human and more authentic and more fun. And uh, have you ever heard, you've probably heard this, Dave, life gets so much easier when people like you. And when people buy from people they like. Now, less than half of the American public votes in presidential elections, if you can believe that. I mean, what? Yeah, no, it's true. Less than half vote, but everybody votes with their money. And all of the packaged good companies, the Procter & Gamble's, the Johnson & Johnson's, who pay a premium for what it is they sell, well, they they know better than anyone I have to create a preference in the mind of the cons consumer so that even a dollar's difference isn't enough to dissuade me from buying your product because I always like it when I see you. I always like when you show up. I love seeing you on the shelf. I love the reassurance of somebody I can trust. And if I were going to leave your your viewers and listeners and, and followers with any one thing, it's that I believe that in business, we vastly underestimate the value of trust. And I mean the dollar value. Repeat customers is where the money is. We all know that. And whether you're a car dealer or a realtor or a mortgage banker or broker, having that person who's coming back to you, not wasting any time searching around, and particularly who will not be dissuaded by half a point of interest because they know that there's there's always things that can go wrong. I need somebody who will guide me through trouble, who will fend off trouble before I even hear from it. Somebody I can rely on. That is an incredibly valuable thing for both the customer and for the person providing the service. So what I discovered over the, the, over the course of that career where I became very much the sort of agency's 
storyteller, you know, trying to persuade people to buy our advertising, I discovered that you return to the fundamentals. So, so, so before we get into the fundamentals, because we could really go a lot of different directions, I, I want folks to realize the agency he was referring to is Saatchi and Saatchi. And people in the ad space, you know, they know who Saatchi Saatchi is. And trust me, kids getting their degrees in marketing, it's it's one of the most coveted places where you could just get an internship. So, the you know, the fact that you spent, you know, a number of years um, as the creative director in LA, like just tells that you got chops, you know, not an easy place to get into and deliver and that, and that you, you grew in the ranks to where you became a, you know, pretty big yeah. executive. Like, like that's a big deal. And, I, was uh, the, I was the least talented person to ever rise to the position I held. The, <laughs> uh, the, um, I spent the bulk of it actually crazy, uh, Dave out in New York city. Um, I was at Saatchi, which is the shark tank. I mean, it was Saatchi and Saatchi in New York. Like, what was I, that like? We could, well, well I don't want to go off quick, pace, but that, you right, know, I'll, I'll tell you very quickly that my, I was a Bay area kid. I was originally from Oakland, California, which always had a kind of chip on its shoulder about San Francisco. You know, I remember, I remember talking to somebody from San Francisco and they made the remark, you know what the best thing about Oakland is its view of San Francisco. And <laughs> It was, it was very true. We always, we, we walked around with a chip on our shoulder. And so if you had told me, oh yeah, you're going to move to New York, I would have said, F you, they can, you know, they can. And then I get out there only to discover, oh my God, I love that place. It was so exciting and fun and creative and exciting. Um, and everything was new and it was constantly recreating itself. And you were a hop, skip and a jump from London. And uh, our company was based in new york and london mm -hmm. and so i spent a lot of time uh, on the continent and uh, i won't go down that rabbit hole but uh, dave it's a funny thing about um uh, discovering things that you didn't think you'd like but really turned out to love that's a that's a formula for a happy life i think yeah well and one more thing before we get into the topic you um you know you've become pretty successful at using social media you know you've You've got a really solid Instagram account, which I follow. Um, you've Thank you for that. kind of done some pretty unique level of success on TikTok. How many, how many total followers on TikTok? On TikTok, I got about 375, 375,000. Yeah. Um, which is not giant, but it's what's nice about that is that's like a band that can reliably sell 50,000 albums. You know, it's like, right. you know, you can make a living. Okay. So um, what it has led to is. I do a lot of speaking engagements because uh, people s seek me out because of the following on TikTok and on Instagram. And um, it's really cool to meet people that feel like they know you because of the stories I tell. You know, the stories that I tell are generally about my own experience and my own life and my own memories and my own family. And so when people reach out to you, they really do. They don't kind of need an introduction. They're, they just, they want to start talking business and so I do a lot of speaking engagements and I do a lot of storytelling coaching. I teach people, uh, uh, C-suite executives generally, how to tell stories because as you can imagine, a, a CEO who is able to communicate a vivid vision for the future and excitement about possibilities in a way that makes them not seem possible, that makes them seem inevitable, that kind of person, that storytelling knack can be the difference between getting funding or not you know, the difference between bankruptcy and billions. And um, it's, it's a, it's an art form, like all art forms. And I've got my, I must have done easily 10,000 presentations over the course of my career. So and, go ahead. Sorry, Dave. Oh, I was going to say that he said something so powerful to be able to tell a story that doesn't just sound possible, but sounds inevitable. Yeah. Like think about, that guys, you know, how if you're a mortgage professional, first of all, you need to be able to do that with, you know, first time home buyers. You need to be able to do that with move up home buyers and and you need to be able to do that with realtors. And if you have that that super power and of of stilling stories that don't just sound passable, that sound inevitable, like think about the competitive differentiation that that gives you and the level of success that that gives you. Um, by, by the way, mortgage coach, they are trust engine innovation team. Let's get some micro content of, uh, you know, that that's going to be your quote that you become famous for in our community, you know, uh, 
Well, it's going to be one of the quotes. I'm sure you're going to say a lot more smart things. So, Neil, why don't you? Why don't you, you? You said you you teach executives that. You you mind giving just your framework for, you know, pretend that you're. Well, first of all, give me some coaching, uh, oh. and everybody can listen into that. Sure. On how how I could you know like let's say first of all it's this it's the first day of December, and we're going to be presenting you know our vision for next year and our strategy for next year. Mm-hmm. And I want to be able to, to tell it in a way that's not just possible, but sounds inevitable. Like, well, coach Dave, me, you, don't, you are probably not in much need of coaching because I, I know you. Everybody's in need of coaching. I'm in need of coaching. Well, I, but I will say that you, what you have going for you is a weapon that many people can't, it's difficult to learn. It's a, it's an enthusiastic authenticity. Now here's why this is so powerful. Because what I have learned over all those presentations and all the coaching years, and particularly, you know, as a a person now in their 60s, you discover that what matters most is not that you are slick or glib or that you are articulate. What matters most is that you are trying to help, that you sincerely want to help someone. And because you want to help, you have done the necessary work to prepare adequately to be of maximum value to the people you're talking to. The, le- the way I learned this, crazy enough, Dave, was oftentimes people would come to me with the problem of stage fright. They were worried that they were going to get up on stage and they were going to freeze because they were too much in their head. And they, you know, it's it stage fright is completely understandable. That is a normal reaction that most people have. There's no time in nature when it was ever a good thing for you to be standing alone, unarmed in front of about 50 pairs of eyeballs all looking at you. That was always danger in, you know, in our ancient days. And so it's a natural reaction that your body's trying to get you to survive. The way we were able to get people over their stage fright was to not through some uh, exercise in you know getting them accustomed to speaking it was focusing entirely on what value are you delivering in what ways is this going to benefit the person you're speaking with or the people let's stay focused on the benefit that you're going to deliver now your job is not to be a great presenter your job is to stay focused on how is this going to help and what happened was I, you know, it's like, I don't care about the pit stains in your shirt. I don't care if you're visibly shaking. I don't care if you, if you're having a little trouble and you've lost your place, stay focused on what are sort of the three things you're there to help someone with. And this, this goes hand in hand with, and, and by the way, just to say, can I tell you a quick story about an actual experience I had where I want to describe to you a presentation that was absolutely awful, but because it provided such value to the audience, it was incredibly well-received. So let me describe it to you, Dave. It goes like this. There was a group of 12 very accomplished, incredibly intelligent businesswomen who were having a a kind of mastermind of their own. And a salesman was brought in to try to pitch them on something. And... (laughs) These women, I mean, they are accomplished. So you better be, you better have your stuff together. This salesman gets introduced, stands up in front of the room, pulls out a speech, handwritten on a piece of torn out paper from a notebook. And he reads the whole thing, his speech, word for word, without looking up, except once, just to sit, you know, sort of out of nervousness. After he's finished with his pitch, he folds his speech back up, puts it in his pocket, and without any kind of call to action, he sits back down, sort of eyes at the floor. Okay, now you would have every reason to believe that there he sold nothing of his inventory of what he was there to sell. But no, on the contrary, he sold everything. And two of the women complimented him on how great a job he'd done. Now, why would they have that reaction? Because he was seven years old and he was there just to sell cookies that he and his sister had baked so that they could earn a way to go to summer camp. The women didn't care that he was slick. In fact, if he'd been slick, it would have been creepy, right? Instead, he was just being himself, doing his level best. And what he was bringing to them was a lot of value in two forms. 
one, they get to support somebody who's trying, you know, their hearts were what were really, what they were buying was their, their own satisfaction at helping somebody else. Their maternal instinct came out and what, what was achieved was how did the little boy make them feel about themselves? He made them feel wonderful about themselves. Did they really need the cookies? Not really. Did they enjoy them? Yes, of course they did. And, the, but they, they, they were expressing, they were able to act on an impulse that they, as business women, didn't get a chance to do much in the professional space. You know how in the professional space, women have to walk that tightrope between being in charge and leading and being interpreted either as a bitch or a pushover. And so for that moment of the day, it was a little vacation. Okay. Now, what does that mean for anybody getting up in front of a room? You are not the hero. Okay. You are the servant. You're there to serve. Now that does not mean, that does not mean cringing and thanking people for letting us come here. No, it definitely means taking charge of the room, but taking charge in the room so that I can help you. I can't wait to share this with you. I'll bet you don't know some of these things I'm about to tell you. When you find out, you're going to be way better off. And I'm really eager to let you know these things. You know, the first 30 seconds of any presentation is the most valuable real estate. And I think people underestimate how important it is for you to jump up and get right to it. So here's what I mean. You notice how some people will get up and they say, how's everybody doing? Or they'll say, thank you so much for being, for letting us come in to talk to you. We're so thrilled to be here. You are, you're burning off the most valuable real estate. What you should be doing is starting with some really cool insight or paradox or riddle. So that what happens is from the minute you're standing in front of them, they are interested and then what you're able to do is, it, it, again, to go back to the stage fright thing, if you know what your first 30 seconds is going to be, you're going to get over your stage fright. You know, you're going to get over your nerves. Dave, you probably had this experience, right? You're standing in front of a room and you're nervous, nervous, nervous all the way up until the moment. But then as soon as you start talking, the nerves dissipate because now it's on. Now the game is on. Like all the Super Bowl quarterbacks will tell you the first time they play in a Super Bowl, the first quarter is it's it's nerve city. Then they then they get into it. And then it's now that that uh, nervous energy is a positive thing. Now it fills them with adrenaline and everything's a little crisper and the spirals are a little tighter. So it's the same when you get up and if you can just script yourself that first 30 seconds to a minute, if you know exactly what you're going to say in that first 30 seconds to a minute, it's going to overcome a lot of your trouble or your, uh, your stage fright. It's going to dissipate a lot of the nerves. And what's more, if you can be compelling in the first 30 seconds, they're going to give you 10 minutes of attention because you bought their interest. You know how it, it, some people just don't seize the room when they first get up there. And I think that's a big mistake. And what they do is they, they sort of let every, you know, for the first 30 seconds, if you're saying, oh, it's so nice to be here, Glenn, thank you for having us. It's so nice to have you. You know, I knew Glenn back when we were in our, you know, oh God, you're, you're blowing off the beachfront property, <laughs> right? You're moving right. inland, man. No. Sell me the sizzle. Buy, and, and I'll give you a great example of a sort of paradox. It would be like somebody would stand up in front of the room and they would say, can anybody in here tell me what serial killers and football coaches have in common? Okay. Everybody is now engaged in this puzzle. Jeez, what the, you know, especially the football coaches and, and sometimes the serial killers. But anyway, the, the, if you can come in with a paradox, like my belief is that right this minute, I know you're going to think this is crazy. I believe that with interest rates at the rate they're at right now, now is the time to strike. Now is the time to buy property. Okay. Everybody in the room is like, why? That you have their interest. A paradox, a riddle, an insight. 
insights are fantastic. One of my favorite things that a friend told me about a year and a half ago, um, he'd done really well in business. And he, because of a product that he had sold during a bidding war, he got the kind of money that he can live on for the rest of his life quite comfortably. And his remark to me was, I think we're celebrating birthdays backwards. Now, he said this without telling me about the money. I think we're celebrating birthdays backwards. Really? I had a really good year, Neil. And I believe that nobody owes me a gift. I should be the one giving out the gifts for, the, for having a great year. And I thought, what a wonderful thing. And then he told me the story of how he accumulated the money. And, and I just thought, wow, that's when you've done well. Yeah, it's time to, it's time to celebrate by giving other people a chance to, to enjoy your success. Now, so anyway, you get my point is that if you, if you come at, if you prepare yourself to come in with a really interesting observation or an insight or a riddle or a paradox or something else that grabs their attention, now you're in charge. It's, and, and uh, even in a room of very powerful people, they're going to be interested. They're going to, they're going to give you the latitude to uh, pay attention. There's nothing more valuable than making sure they're focused on you. Yeah. No, bro, this is your first time in this community. I absolutely know I'm going to want to have more interviews with you, assuming you're, you're game to continue oh. to, to invest in this course, platform. Dave. I just want to review a few things and have a closing thought with you. Um, so, so first of all, you know, the, the, you know, you want to storytell from the heart. You've got to, what's the word you use? Um, two words I'd never heard put together and enthusiastically enthusiastic authenticity. Um, authenticity yeah that's you did uh, that's yeah it. and 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 it's funny i i posted on social media this week um this little quote i i posted um what matters more than your resume is the energy you brought to that meeting yeah. energy and confidence always win you know um i had a really smart friend of mine who said you know you're right most of the time but sometimes, you know, you have those silent killers, people that, you know, they don't have that charisma and they don't have that energy and confidence, but yet they're killers. They listen and then when they jump in and, and, and here's uh, my yeah. point, you know what they all, you know what they have though? Everyone who wins is enthusiastic authenticity. Like, you know who they are. They are, you know, might be different than a, you know, a high I high D speaker and an introvert will have a different approach, but they'll both, it will be from a place of their heart. It'll be from a place of authenticity. I want to make sure everyone caught the, you know, we're, we're, we're not the heroes. Our customers are the hero. We're the guide. Yeah. You know, I'm a big fan of story brand by Donald Miller. And I've actually interviewed Donald and, um, you know, talk about that. So we align on that. Um, I love the the three things when you want to, it's, it's storytelling time. Remember the goal, guys, is to be able to, to tell a story so well that not only do they think what you're saying is possible, they think what you're saying is inevitable. So I do think that that's a super um, power in this market. And he said, come with three things to help people. So as you prepare for your next meeting, um, you know, be thinking of all these points. And with that said, Knowing that, hey, this is mortgage realtors, we provide and fund the American dream in America. Any any closing thoughts before we wrap up our first uh, podcast together? Uh, you know, it's funny. I wish we had a, a, another whole podcast right on so we could get Well, more by the way, we, we can schedule another one. We can make okay. this part one. Yeah, let's do it. Part one? Let's, let's do it, Dave, because because uh, I do want to get into more of the, okay, what are the fundamentals of storytelling? So, so everybody, stuff? listen, this is part one. We're going to schedule another one. And let's <laughs> schedule a full hour next time because yeah. I know you're a long form guide like me. Um, yeah, exactly. And then we could talk it out for an hour. I like, I like to set talk. the table for part two. For a long, okay, good. But but just to, to leave off for uh, for today and to benefit your your listeners, the when I say you are not the hero, I want to remind people of the a very important a part of storytelling. Do not cast yourself as the hero of the story. When you do that, you run the risk of having them be skeptical about anything they hear from you from then on. Because there's this great quote from George Orwell, which is, no autobiography is to be trusted unless it reveals something disgraceful. Because any person who gives a good account of themselves 
is probably lying since when you look at a life from the inside, it's really mostly a matter of defeats. And it's very, it's when people talk about how wonderful they are, it does not produce the emotion that you think it does. What we need to be doing is you don't want the audience to be looking up at you and thinking, oh, he wants me to think he's a big shot. What you want them to be doing is standing next to you while you describe someone or something that you admire. So even if you accomplished something wonderful and you'd like to talk about it, give it to somebody else and talk about it. Same story, same action, but put somebody else at the center of it and you be the one who watched it and was inspired by it. And then what happens is you and I are experiencing this together. We're standing next to one another. And one of the best pieces of advice I ever got from a, a car dealer was, he said that his mantra was, I'll lose a little money to make a friend. You can never have enough friends in any business. And you're going to lose them if you try to self-aggrandize. Don't tell everybody how wonderful you are. In fact, I kind of broke my own rule by talking about myself and you know, at Saji. But you know, I'm going to learn from that experience. But nevertheless, um, try to try to make sure that what people know about you is they know your values because they know who you admire and why they know the stories are about things you learned sometimes because you made a mistake. Those are actually the best kind. It humanizes you, but you don't want to appear the victim at the end. Instead, you want to be somebody who learned from your mistakes and that's the best you can do. So there you go. I wanted to leave everybody with that. Well, that was awesome for anyone that wants to, uh, Follow you on social. Let them know the best places. Also, if they want to, you know, you've got a pretty valuable um, mailing list that ranges from free to you have some premium offerings. What would be the way for people to follow you and get into your community and learn from you more? Um, so uh, because I spell my name sort of strangely, I'm the only person on earth with my name. N-E-A-L-F-O-A-R-D. You can find me at neilford.com. That's my little website where I talk about um, a kind of adventure I want to take across the country. And then uh, they can find me on Instagram by at Neil Ford, N-E-A-L-F-O-A-R-D. Or on TikTok, same thing, <laughs> Neil Ford. And um, on YouTube as well that way. So uh, there you go. I, I'm, I will be, uh, Dave, by the time we have the next podcast, I'm hoping that I'll have my story fire course up and running 18 modules and uh, that'll be story well, let's, fire. yeah let's make sure we plan it around that and yeah. uh that way we can announce that and you guys the other thing he, he didn't tell you but his slides and his presentations are are very visually clear and inspiring you know so he's got a cool website you know learn more about him uh buy some merch you know, as you click yeah. into this audio book, which I highly recommend you check out, uh, you know, you'll you'll learn more about everything he has and and even um, see some of the premium solutions he has. Uh, black tier, black coffee <laughs> tier, uh, bourbon tier. Uh, I'm looking forward to learning more about all that. But, but guys, I, I think this is someone that mortgage and real estate professionals that want to... Uh, not only be incredibly successful, but have a good time doing it. Uh, you know, I'm I'm big on being purpose driven. I, I'm also big on being a profit driven entrepreneur. But that that blend of purpose and profits is where it's at. And I think this is someone you, that you want to follow on social media and someone that you want to learn from, if if that's how you want to roll in this business. So, thank you for this first um, conversation interview. I'm looking forward to the next one, my man. Thank. Uh, Let's give you a little fist bump here, yeah, right a on. virtual fist bump. Yeah. And, uh, thank you, Neil. I, hey, thank you, I Dave. Enjoyed I, it. That was very generous of you. I always love talking to you. I can't wait for our next one. We'll really dig in. We'll really dig in. And I've got a bunch of incredibly useful stuff. I really do. Stay tuned, everybody. Okay. Be on the next one.